All right, we get back on track, and uh, our next speaker is Ed from Weizmann Institute of Science. I mean, I didn't say his last name because he told me it was not possible. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I was afraid to say his last name. Okay. And he's going to tell us about the uh, collisions uh, between cold molecules in uh, superconducting magnetic track. So Ed, apologize. Thank you very much. Great. At some point, I will forget my own name, so don't worry. <laughs> yeah, that will happen. Excellent. So what I will talk about is uh, actually one experiment that we do in our lab. But first of all, let me thank really the people who did everything. So mostly today, I talk. I will speak about deceleration. So it is led by Yair now. Yair is a PhD student finishing. He thinks he's finishing in a half a year. A surprise. Michael, also a PhD student, and uh, Martin Pitzer, Dr. Martin Pitzer, he's a postdoc with us for more than a year. Soon he will be looking for a position. Excellent guy. So what I will talk, only one slide, is a few experiments, with many experiments actually, that we did with a merge beam. So collisions with molecules and atoms at very low temperatures, reaching a few millikelvin. And it was really done, most of it, by Yuval, who is sitting here. So any questions to Yuval? And now it is led by Prerna and Abanita, two girls, really doing fantastic work. So what do we do? I will tell you just in one slide, with merged beams. So first of all, in 2012, we solved the problem of uh, reaching really low collision energies with uh, supersonic beams, which are fast, as Bas mentioned, by simply merging them. So we use very high magnetic field gradients. We merge two supersonic beams. And at the end, you have two packets of atoms or molecules that collide in the moving frame of reference. So both of them are extremely fast, about kilometer per second, but the relative velocity of control, and we can play with it. And this is uh, something you obviously cannot see. But this is collision energy. This is cross-section. And you see that we can actually cover five decades of collision energy in a single experiment. And we see these nice shape resonances. Again, something that was referred to. And we made actually quite new, a like, few interesting experiments. So here you see the isotope effect. I think even more interesting, we looked at the shape resonances as a messenger, used them as a messenger, and looked what happens if you take a molecule in two different states, in two different rotational states, in ground state and rotational excited. And they are two very, very different beasts <coughs> when you are real at low collision energy. When you go into quantum regime, you become very different. We also looked at very fast reactions, so again, at the Langevin regime, and again, looked what happens when you take two different symmetries. Ground state, which is symmetric, and rotational excited state, which breaks symmetry. Very different again beasts. But this is not what I'm talking today. So today, I will tell you about an experiment we built for 10 years. And finally, it started working. And uh, what we are trying to do is to go to ultra-cold regime with cold molecules without using lasers. So again, trying to find a general, as general as possible. Nothing is general. There is no silver bullet here. And the idea is very sort of simple. If you look at a, gener at a generic collatum experiment, you always can divide it in several parts. You start with some source, right, oven, as the simplest. Usually you need to decelerate, not necessarily. Then you trap, laser cool, and eventually the last step in 99.9% .9 of these experiments, reaching really the ultra-cold regime, is done by evaporation. A very simple process. And it's a general process. You really don't need all of the laser cooling to start evaporation, as we know from John's experiments with metastable helium and from Dan Klebner's experiment with atomic hydrogen. So you can evaporate from hundreds of millikelvin, right? But what do you need for that? You need collisions. Of course, other methods, so you know, this is my tribute to really brave people who work extremely hard and uh, build molecules with laser-cooled atoms, so Feshbach molecules. And I think I, I really envy them, right, for many years, because we really can see, we can reach high enough densities and see collisions between trapped molecules. How do you see that? The easiest way is just to observe a decay, right? And if you see something which is non-exponential as a function of time, of course, you say, OK, this is two body collisions. Here you are. So again, laser cooling. So we are in a different camp, right? So you don't want to do laser cooling. You want to do direct cooling. What are options? Again, there are many, many ingenious methods. So again, John used the dilution refrigerator. You have everything uh, done with supersonic beams, so spearheaded by Aaron Meyer and Bass and Rick. So really amazingly beautiful experiments. Another idea from uh, Rempes Group, 
Martin is also here. Where's Martin? Here. Oh, excellent. Right, so again, effusive source, it can be called effusive source. So many, many very different ideas. What do we choose? We work with supersonic expansion as our source. So again, we start with generation of cold molecules. We use very high pressure gas, expand it to vacuum, and instead of thermal distribution, you get a beautiful supersonic beam. It can be as cold as one Kelvin. A nice picture, right? We can actually see these beams. So this is our supersonic expansion generated with Evan Levy valve. We ignite plasma, and you actually see quite nasty behavior. So <laughs> this is funny, right? So this is about four centimeters away. We generate cold gas, but you see it hits a skimmer, generates beautiful shock waves that actually block propagation of your beams. So it's funny enough, these beams are really dense. So what is the plan? The plan is to use our source to generate cold molecules also called atoms, whatever you know you can entrain in supersonic expansion, by collisions will be cooled as any buffer gas experiment. So what is the price? Of course, we pay cash 22. So these are very fast packets of molecules and atoms. How fast? A few hundred meters per second. So first stage that we have to do, we have to decelerate them. Then we have to load it in some kind of trap. It can be electrostatic, magnetic, maybe microwave trap, any trap that you like. And then you would ideally try attempt evaporation. So let me start with the magnetic slowing. So this is the machine. It's two and a half meters long. How does it work? A very, very simple idea. So again, it's inspired by a uh, moving uh, magnetic conveyor belt done by Hensch, Esslinger, Greiner, and Bloch. And it is extremely simple. So this is propagation axis of our beam. We, generate, we build many magnetic traps that overlap. They overlap in space. So you see they are beautifully interleaved. Now, in order to generate moving magnetic field, what do we do? We magnetize, right? We send current through trap number one. Number two, it has to overlap. Number three, another overlap. What it will generate? It will generate a magnetic quadrupole beam that will move in space and in time. How does it look? In simulation, let me run it. So first of all, what you will see are three panels. So in the upper panel, you will see average velocity for the bunch. Second is just a one-dimensional cut through magnetic field. So this is the longitudinal magnetic field. And this is a two-dimensional picture. And you see the blue and the black. These are two quadrupole uh, traps that overlap, that are uh, being switched on. So let me. Run the movie. Oh, it's jet lagged. <laughs> As me, I guess. Okay, so no, no movies. Excellent. What you would see, you would simply see that we are generating this nice two-dimensional minima, and it would move in time. Why it doesn't move? I have no clue, but whatever. So, what is the channel challenge? It doesn't sound that bad, but the problem is that we have to have very deep magnetic trap. How deep? Well, as hot as our ensemble. Our ensemble is about one Kelvin, so we have to have one Kelvin deep magnetic trap translated into magnetic field. It's one Tesla deep magnetic field. Okay? One Tesla field, our coils are about one centimeter diameter. So to generate one Tesla, we have to pulse 500 amps. Now we have to be adiabatic. We want to catch our cloud decelerated without losing numbers, without heating, so we want to conserve phase space density. What does it mean? You have to be adiabatic. Adiabaticity demands distance. So it's about two and a half meters long. 480 overlapping traps, so almost a thousand <coughs> coils. Each one has to get a pulse, and we need to decelerate, decelerate fast, 3,000 Gs. So what does it mean? It means that we have to generate pulses starting about 20 microseconds, and slowly extending them to millisecond. So what is the biggest challenge, actually? is really that this whole thing doesn't go out in smoke. And that, trust me, with these voltages and with these currents, it's a challenge. So this is a second generation device. First generation device was really hard to operate, but this one solved many, many problems that we had. So this is the deceleration excellent works now into trapping. 
So how did we do trapping two years ago? We used the idea that was first, I think, done by June, is simply take two permanent magnets. So two magnets, of course, is nice, but you somehow have to open the door, right? We have to load our molecules into the strap, so how, what do we need to do? We need to somehow destroy, right, one magnet, load, and then it has to reappear. So for molecule that has dipole moment, you can use electric fields. We actually do everything magnetically, so we have another small coil inside here, which cancels magnetic field of the permanent magnet, so opens the door, and it closes. So that we did in 2016 already. And not surprisingly, everything works quite nice. Which molecule did we choose? For us, the easiest molecule, one given by nature that has paramagnetic moment, is molecular oxygen. And here you are. This is the lifetime of our O2 in the trap, in this magnetic trap, was 670 milliseconds. You add lithium, it lives even shorter. You measure, what do you see? Beautiful exponential decay, right? So what do we measure? We measure collisions of O2 and lithium with our background gas. So, in one word, it sucks, right? So what do we need to do, right? This is really nowhere enough time to observe collisions. Way too short. So there are two things that you want to do. One thing, you need longer trapping lifetime. Improve your vacuum. Easy. Second, I want actually a new knob in my lab. I want to be able to change the gradient of our magnetic field. Why do I want that? Because I want to manipulate. If I have my permanent magnets, right, there's absolutely nothing I can change anymore. I cannot compress, I cannot open, I can do absolutely nothing. So I want a knob that actually changes the magnetic field gradient. But it changes somewhere in the order gradients that we need is about a Tesla per millimeter. So how to do it? Electromagnets, they will not work. Electromagnets work well when we pulse them, right? For a millisecond, yes. But if I will try to run DC current of 500 amps through the coils that we have, they will work beautifully as fuse, right? They will evaporate. So, uh, you know, you scratch your head and you think, aha, I need a small coil with high magnetic field, let's go superconducting. So what type of superconducting? Uh, you check, you know, what your NMR magnet is built of. So, so use, we use low temperature superconductors, a very nice material, niobium titanium. First thing that I did actually, I called my colleagues at Weizmann to ask if it's a good idea. Why? What's the problem here? The problem, again, that we don't need a DC field, right? The NMR magnet, MRI machine works at very high magnetic fields, but DC, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, we need to be able to switch on and off magnetic fields very fast. So again, I called my colleagues. They were extremely polite, surprisingly enough, <laughs> and they told me you know, it's a bad idea. Now, Middle East mentality is a bit different, let me explain. So we take advice, but only if we like that advice. <laughs> so, so I didn't like the advice. That's why we spent another few months actually building small coils, so this is, you see, around a centimeter across, inner diameter of six millimeters, and this is a small coil that is built from superconducting material, niobium titanium. We learned a lot of tricks from one of the physicists coming from John's lab, so really nice. What's the problem? Well, it doesn't work. So, to put it nicely, it has a poor AC response. Okay, well, it quenches actually. How bad? Interesting, if you ever want to try, you can reach, if you cool this beast, to three Kelvin, you can actually pulse about 20% of critical current in this coil. Only 20%. This is not enough at all. And the problem is that I cannot cool our trap to three Kelvin, which we did, you know, when we tried, when we did our experiments, because I need some access. It will never be as cold as three Kelvin or four Kelvin even. So that doesn't work. So you know, next thing, logically to try, is instead of low temperature to go to high temperature superconductors. What's the idea? Why? They're by far more robust. Actually, they superconduct already at 90 Kelvin. So it's IPCO. It's a coup rate. So they look like they are tapes with a very thin layer of superconductor deposited. It's one micron, actually, layer. And when you take this nice wire and you simply you know, make a coil, and it's extremely, it's, it really is amazing because it's extremely robust. We cool it to 15 Kelvin. 
and we pulse through this coil to uh, about 200 amps without any problem. So we can switch on magnetic field of few Tesla and actually in a few hundred microseconds easily. Why is, why it is nice? Because it gives us really one of knob in the lab, but now we can turn to 11. What do I mean by that? So <laughs> this is just a schematic picture. Again, a finite element analysis simulation of magnetic field. In a, this is called a pancake, actually, a trap. So you see, this is the magnetic field that we need in order to load our cold molecules. So it's about 0.3 Kelvin deep. The gradients are matched to the gradients in our moving magnetic trap decelerator. But now, so it's about 30 amps. But you know, we can go to 200 amps. That compresses the cloud about a factor of six, which gives us about a factor of 10 in collision rate between particles that we trap, which is nice. Density is something that we always fight, and here we have now additional knob, which doesn't, well, changes, of course, density, but really increases the collision rate. What are the challenges here? There are many. Actually, this is the best picture that we ever produced in my lab. I'm proud of it. I didn't do it. <laughs> so what are the challenges? It's damn complicated, right? Why it is complicated? So let's start with decelerator. So this is the decelerator, right? 480 stages, right? So of course it's in the air. Of course it's at room temperature. Somehow I have, to, I have to cross into vacuum, right? And not only to cross into vacuum, I have actually to take these few last stages of decelerator and I have to cool them. Why do I have to cool them? Because I have to shield really the cold part where we have a superconducting trap from room temperature, from radiation, right? From black body. So you have here a section of the accelerator which you cool to 40 Kelvin. You don't want large distance because you will lose density. So what we have here, air, vacuum, 40 Kelvin, and we have our vacuum chamber as thin as one millimeter. So this is one millimeter thin stainless steel, and we really go from here to here with a gap of 0.5 millimeters. Next, again, you have to separate, right? 40 Kelvin has to be separated from the second stage where the holes of the superconducting trap at 15 Kelvin. And when you need to measure, right, how do we measure? We measure by ionizing O2 using RMP. So we send a beam, UV beam, ionize, and we extract and measure on the MCP detector. How does it look? So this is our trap. Again, few centimeters across. You see that this is connected to the 4K stage of our craft stuff flexibly because, man, many, many problems here. These nice braids actually past 200 amps. This is actually the front view. So this is the cold module. This is the 40 Kelvin module. You see more aluminum that now hides your, um, our superconducting trap inside. And then you have to integrate everything. So here, this is room temperature. On the other side, it's air. This is one millimeter thick stainless, a half a millimeter gap, 40 Kelvin, 15 Kelvin, and extraction. Laser comes from back here. So you see you have this nice bucket now, trap is inside, this is cryo cooler. You need to lift it, it's really heavy. So we have an engine in the lab. I'm not joking. So Michael actually participated in the uh, reach semifinals of Ninja Israel. He's a strong guy. <laughs> so you need, of course, somebody has to align everything. You have to have really good students for that. So this is Yair. He did complain a lot, <laughs> but you know, but he's a fantastic guy. So uh, alignment and design was done by Yair. And then again, so results, right? We need to measure. So what we are against, a half a, mil a, half a second lifetime, this is what we had at room temperature trapping. What do we have now? So here, the result. So we start. What do I show you here? So this is actually O2 signal as a function of time. You start at 10 milliseconds, you extract ions, and this is what you measure on your MCP <laughs> detector. You change delay, right, of extract, oh, I'm sorry, of detection, and you know, slowly, slowly, you see that your molecules are disappearing. So let's start. Let's start actually with a dilute sample. What do I mean by that? We trap our molecules at almost one Kelvin deep trap, but then we release most of them. Okay, so we reduce our intensity of our beam by a factor almost of 10. 
How? Simply by opening the trap to 50 millikelvin. And now we measure. So first of all, what do you see? From half a second, now our lifetime, vacuum limited lifetime, is 50 seconds. We measure nice signal you see by the error bar, even after a minute and a half, 90 seconds. So this problem completely solved, right? Beautiful. But this is a beautiful exponent, right? Now, so let's go to denser samples, right? What do I mean? So you see eventually eight, we reach 800 millikelvin, and the picture becomes completely different. You see that your signal decays faster and faster when you go to denser and denser samples of O2. If you look at the fit, it's a beautiful fit to two-body collisions. So finally, we really see direct observation of cold bimolecular collisions in a trap without any laser cooling. Is it the whole story? No. So ideally, here we could start try cooling, right? We see two-body collisions. Nice. We could try evaporation. For evaporation to work, unfortunately, you have to have good properties, right? What do I mean by good properties? You have to have a nice ratio of elastic to inelastic collision rate. And this is something really hard to predict theoretically. So this is something that I took from uh, Jeremy's uh, work. I think this is magnesium NH, right? Jeremy, you don't recognize it. Ah! Oh. I, I see. So uh, you see, even the theorist doesn't recognize his own work. So it's a molecule atom collision. And this is the problem. So you see, you scale. This is scaling parameters. So you globally scale potential surface. And you see that you can, at some realizations, you have perfect conditions for evaporation. But sometimes you hit this ugly regime where you know, evaporation simply doesn't work because you have the same order or magnitude for elastic and inelastic processes. Can we estimate it for O2? We actually can. How do we do that? By probing different regions of our trap. And what is the idea here? Think about it. If I probe the edge of my trap, right, you hit it really at the edge, I will be more susceptible to elastic collisions, right? Molecules will boil off, and you will lose them mostly because of elastic scattering. And this, of course, will not happen from the center. How do I know where I am in my trap? So here is, again, knob that goes to 11. So you start with a very shallow trap, 50 millikelvins. And you have these are two traces for O2 signal that we extract from within the trap. This red is at the center, and the blue is at the edge. Now, what do we do? We compress it. How do we compress it? Adiabatically, slowly, by a factor of, you know, almost more than 10. What happens? At the center, you see that our intensity becomes larger, clear. What happens at the edge? There's no signal, right? The cloud now is smaller than 1.4 millimeters, and simply signal disappears. So we really know that we're extracting molecules from different parts of from trap. What is more interesting, the decay rate depends on that position. So from the center, indeed, it is slower. But this bad news that the good to bad uh, ratio is only 7, order of 7. Not enough. We need about 20 to be able to start cooling. That's not the only, so, you know, really, we wanted more sanity checks. Maybe, you know, something, vacuum, five more minutes, one more minute. <laughs> but you said there is a lot of time to bust. This is not fair. <laughs> so, sanity checks, right? How do we do sanity check? And really, I didn't believe results until, you know, we nailed all of the possible nails. What's a nice sanity check for us? We work with magnetic fields. Not again, this is a bit different from star deceleration. We don't depend on on having a dipole moment. We can use atoms. And what do we do? We load lithium into our trap. How do we do it? Shittiest way possible. We simply ablate lithium somewhere in our source chamber. It really is not important where you do it. And we load, how much do we load? Almost nothing. About ten to the six lithium atoms. So density is very low. So there is no possibility for two-body collision, lithium-lithium, OK? So this is only lithium. You see lifetime, vacuum limited, 14 seconds, shorter than oxygen, logical. Why? Because the cross-section is larger, lithium H2. OK, now, different experiment. 
we have both oxygen and lithium. You measure oxygen decay, well, it doesn't care about lithium. Why? Lithium is minority, my, minority by at least three orders of magnitude. There's hardly any lithium there. Okay? But what happens to lithium? Well, it disappears completely. In two seconds, you see that you hardly see any lithium left. So this is also funny. Why it's so fast? Well, the mass ratio, of course. Lithium is much lighter than oxygen, and we lose it much faster. We boil it off from the trap by the collisions with molecular oxygen. So, next. That, I must say, I was quite surprised that it worked, but yeah. So, loading the superconducting trap, we can do it. We have additional knob. Nice. Collisions, we see. Evaporation, we cannot do with oxygen. So, here, finally, I, I really started hating oxygen. It's way, you know, overrated. So, what can we do? Search for better candidates. And this is the nice thing about well, it's, again, generality that we have. We can switch to other molecules. What we will try first, actually, the different isotopes. By different isotopes, I started in my first slide showing you that collisional properties are sensitive to rotational state. Oxygen that we breathe, the lowest rotational state is actually G equal 1, rotational excited state. It's more susceptible to any to an isotropy. 1717, the lowest state is actually ground state, G equal 0. Same will be, of course, for mixed isotopes, 1618, for example. So this is first candidates that we are actually now working in our lab. And then other molecules. So NH, NH2, a CH3, this is something that Taka is doing in Vancouver. So there are a few possibilities that we can try, and we will. So how far we will go? It, it really depends on nature now. So it has to sort of help us. So again, thank you very much, people who give us money. Always we, we are thankful. So again, Yair led this experiment. Julia, she's our electrical engineer. Same name, very difficult name, right? <laughs> Michael Karpov, also PhD student, worked a lot on the second generation decelerator. Martin, he's really a good postdoc. And his son was postdoc before Martin. He was responsible for bu building this second uh, decelerator in our lab. A really gifted guy. OK, thank you very much. Sorry, what was the temperature at which you were starting your attempt to develop the cooling? 800 millikelvin. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, many, 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 many partial labor. Sure. Six, actually. Yeah, sure. Many. The trouble is that each one of them gives you, gives you separate opportunities for, um, for inelasticity. Huh? And so those, those sure. zeros that you do get are mm -hmm. The peak minima that you do get in the elastic cross sections mm -hmm. will be in different places for different Right. I don't think this is the problem, actually. No, I, I, I agree. So that, that, that I really don't think is a problem. It's <laughs> hard for me to comment on this. I mean, you know, give us a better simulation, and then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so we did simulation, so DSMC simulation of uh, trap with averaged uh, cross-sections. So we used a single cross-section, right? So this is an average over up to 800 millikelvins. Again, we don't really care that particular energy. But we extract so, but it from but simulation. You say you need a factor of 20, as, like how? No, I need a factor of 20. We have about factor of 5, 7. We need factor of 20 to see cooling. Right, right, right. Not necessarily to be in a runaway evaporation regime, but at least to see some cooling, right? right? So ideally what I would like to see, right, that when we cool, that the density at the center of the trap, instead of losing, becomes higher. Right? Right. But I guess you, so you didn't really have an independent measurement of these collision rates. I, it's like, how confident are you in the 7 and not 20 already? Oh. So with 20, we would, with 20, again, we would see cooling. I would be, that would be completely clear. A confident, again, it's definitely below 10 for sure, right? If it's, you know, 5 or 7, I, I will not claim it. Yeah, so uh, any of those molecules you listed, I think, that would be very 
very interested in. I would put a plug in for NH just because when we, we did this uh, nitrogen atom right. NH trapping mm -hmm. plant, we co-trapped them, it seemed, based on the inelastic cross-section, that the NH behaved very much like an atom in the, in the collision with mm -hmm. nitrogen atom. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's because of that large, rotation. very large rotation. Yes, constant. exactly. Makes so, sense. Makes you know, sense. I, I uh -huh. Trying to bias you. Okay, to run. <laughs> <laughs> but the O17, O17 is also. That's also. It's interesting to see exactly. We will see that. Yes, exactly. 